So today is the um, final webinar in our uh, series of uh, fundamental um, data interpretation um, principles. Um, if any of you have attended our previous webinars, uh, we focused on things like turbines and diesel engines and reducers and stuff like that. And for the last uh, webinar in the series, we're going to be focusing on hydraulics. So, um, brief introduction. My name is Mark Pinkerton. I'm an account manager here at Fluid Life. That uh, if you have any questions or anything, um, the session is available at uh, fluidlife.com after the fact. And, and if you do have any questions, you can contact myself. There's my email address up there, as well as our customer care is kind of a catch-all for all inquiries, uh, whether they be administrative or technical or anything like that. Okay, so today um, we're going to be focusing on, uh, like I said, data interpretation for hydraulic components. Um, it's going to be fairly basic, uh, but the first thing I always like to talk about is e the data interpretation process. So um, re regardless of what type of report you're looking at, whether it's hydraulics or any other type of component or any other type of fluid for that matter, um, you want to take in everything, all all relevant information, right? So not just the the data from that particular sample. You're going to want to look at um, sampling history, uh, trending, you know, component hours, uh, fluid hours. Um, have you know that component been through any recent repairs, any reported problems, you know, anything documented in your your maintenance system. Uh, recommendations from you know your oil supplier your OEM all that stuff so just remember to take everything as much information as you possibly can into consideration and then your your decision depending on the results and all the other variables you know there's there's various types of of responses you can take you know you can you can be as basic as ignoring results you know a step up from that would just be to drop the oil change the oil Right, and then and what we're hoping that you're doing um, on the longer term with with this data is you know follow the trending, and then you know if a problem arises maybe request some troubleshooting. Um, you know if it's a problem that can't be fixed maybe consider changing your PM intervals or or something like that. So uh, we're gonna go through this process near the end when I show you some examples. But this is just, you know, a kind of a general um, guideline that we would say uh, in all webinars, regardless of the component type that you're, uh, you're actually ta um, we're talking about here. So, focus in on hydraulics. Um, you know, we could give webinars on on specific hydraulic applications in terms of data interpretation, um, depending on what you're doing. You know, if you are a mobile equipment uh, planner or if you're managing stationary equipment or, or whatever the case is, um, the configuration and application of uh, your hydraulic system is going to be uh, fairly different. So again, take that into consideration. But what we're going to talk about today is kind of basic fundamentals that apply um, across the board. Um, like I said, you know, you're going to want to know the configuration of your system. So total uh, fluid volume, pressures, temperatures, you know, clearances on valves and stuff like that. Uh, and then again, I know this is uh, repeating myself already, but know your sample information, be aware of, um, you know, your hydraulic application and obviously the working environment too. So um, testing your hydraulic fluid. We have some standard tests uh, for mobile and fixed equipment. Uh, the biggest difference being expected fluid life, right? So in, in mobile, so just on a normal hydraulic on a dozer or excavator or whatever, uh, you're likely going to change the oil a lot quicker than you would on a big um, hydraulic system and in, in reservoir in a fixed plant setting. So there's a couple additional standard tests for fixed equipment that we'll talk about. And then we'll also talk about some additional tests that's trying to help you key in on a, on a couple things. 
Um, but uh, what we're going to be using today as a general schematic is um, what a basic hydraulic system looks like as I start talking about um, data interpretation, right? So, you know, this is fairly basic and in most uh, systems you're going to have a, a big reservoir or some form of reservoir, some form of filter, some form of pump uh, with some form of motor, uh, some form of directional or control valve, and then the actual, you know, hydraulic cylinder or, or whatever the specific component is um, in that hydraulic system. Okay, so... Um, if you attended my previous webinar on, on diesel engines, um, you're in luck. Uh, basic data interpretation for hydraulics is a lot easier, um, less complicated. It's mostly going to be uh, contamination and oil uh, health, you know, oxidation health. Um, in terms of contamination, you know, what you're going to want to be looking for is points of, of ingression um, mainly. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's mostly common sense, you know, the breather on the reservoir, if uh, your filter ever goes into bypass, um, if you have uh, broken or failed seals on your cylinder or anything like that. So um, common sense, again, nothing is going to be too complicated today. Solid particulate in, in terms of contamination, so actual solid particles, uh, is probably the biggest uh issue related to hydraulic and hydraulic functionality. Um, there's various sources of contamination. Obviously, I talked about ingression a little bit uh, there. So that's just, you know, when debris enters the system, uh, regardless of, of the source of ingression, it's, uh, it's all kind of all the same. Um, Built-in contaminants. So if uh, there was a an oil drain, uh, let's say a component is a fresh component and there's a little bit of break in wear um, and the, there wasn't, uh, you know, we're never going to get 100% proper drain and flush, but if the percentage of efficiency is, is not nowhere near close to 100%, then you may have some debris left over that'll continue to circulate in the system and continue to show up on your reports. Contaminants from new oils. Um, you know, there's a slide on this, but, uh, you know, new oils are not always as clean as, as you may think they are. And then finally, internally generated. So if you have any wear um, that is uh, generated in any part of the system and that starts to circulate in the oil, well, that's considered a contaminant as well. And it'll behave more or less the same as it would uh, from external ingression, you know, potentially cause additional wear. So four main um, categories of solid particulate uh, contamination to look out for. Okay, how are uh, these things represented on reports? Um, the main result is through ISO particle counts. Okay, um, on the reports, you get the larger than four micron, larger than six micron, and larger than 14 micron um, categories. Uh, this is the ISO standard uh, for fluid life. If you go on our portal, then we offer diff, um, uh, other categories, so higher categories all the way up to 100. Um, we just don't put them on our PDF reports. Okay, If you're at all familiar uh, with ISO codes, you'll know that um, the 4, 6, and 14 uh, micron categories um, correspond to the ISO codes here. So the first number is going to be uh, a representation of the four micron category, the second number of the six, and the third number of the 14. Okay, um, the next slide will show you how these are calculated based on the individual counts for a particular micron category. But in general, the higher your codes, uh, the dirtier your oil is, okay? One big thing to remember, and I'll mention this again during the uh, wear metal and ICP uh, section, result section, is that there is kind of a crossover between your particle counts and your ICP results, which uh, correspond to um, wear metals, contaminants, and stuff like that. So ICP results will 
stop measuring particles in elemental concentrations when you hit approximately the four to five micron size thresholds for a particle, okay? And um, compared to isoparticle counts where we start counting uh, particles above the four micron size, okay? So I'll dig into that a little bit more um, when we hit the examples, but just know that the the concentrations uh, reported on your ICP results may not necessarily always reflect what uh, is being counted in terms of particulate as the limitations to both tests kind of stop and start when the other one stops and vice versa. Okay, so again, if you're unfamiliar with how particle counts uh, or isoparticle codes are uh, calculated, um, we have this scale here here's all the corresponding iso codes and here is are the ranges um, of particles corresponding to that particular uh, iso code now these um, counts uh, are completed in one milliliter of oil so it, it's an extremely low volume of oil so in the grand scheme of things you know when you're talking uh, about uh, let's say the six mi micron category in this particular example, 320 uh, particles is more or less the same as say 336, right? So that's why um, this ISO uh, scale was developed and then we, we would rather talk in ISO codes. It's a little bit easier to understand and you know, we're not talking about uh, 160,282 individual particle counts for the four micron category. Okay, so what we did here is this is our count for four microns. We found ourselves in this range, so the corresponding code is 18. Uh, 18. So just quickly, I won't spend too much more time on this. If you were to uh, create an ISO code for these particular counts, the code would obviously be 18, 16, 13, which isn't too, uh, too bad for a hydraulic. Okay, moving on. Um, ingression. So I did mention that uh, when elemental concentrations stop, particle counts start in terms of particulate detection, but it's very rare. Um, it's not unheard of, but it's pretty rare that you are not going to get uh, various sizes of, in, um, you know, external uh, contaminants or even wear metal for, for that matter. So there should be some evidence sometimes of um, you know what is actually the source of your contamination. So you may have high particle counts, right? But hopefully you should still see some evidence of um, uh, external ingression. So here we have uh, silicone or silicon and aluminum which you know if if you know uh, fundamentals of data interpretation this is obviously dirt ingression right and then we do have some wear here as a result so what would be likely here is if you look at your iso codes as well you're probably going to have flagged iso codes uh, because we have evidence of uh, dirt ingression and then subsequent wear so chances are that you know uh, the the ingression of contaminants and the wear generated is not going to be uniformly under four to five microns in size uh, so we should have um, elevated particle counts as well but that's one way you can kind of correlate to other results in terms of your iso codes to try and figure out what's going on okay i uh, just want to talk about new oil here for a second um, so as a source of, uh, of contamination, um, you know, so don't always trust that uh, the new oil you're putting into your hydraulic system is going to be clean. It's very, very common for new oil to go in and then your filter does its job and then you notice after maybe one or two samples that your ISO count is actually going down depending on the, uh, the sampling intervals that you have. Uh, basically, all that's proving is your filter is doing its job and it's cleaning up some of the dirt and particulate that was present in your new oil. 
So one of the easiest things that you can do to um, improve your overall lube program, especially from a hydraulic fluid standpoint, or even lube oil or you know bearing systems or anything like that, um, would be to pre-filter your oil. As you can obviously hear, it, you know you can see it makes a big difference. And then this also just kind of gives you a visual representation of um, how the difference uh, visually of cleanliness between um, ISO codes. Okay, another uh, important um, contaminant we should talk about is water. Okay, water can have various uh, negative effects on uh, your hydraulic fluid. You know, uh, primarily it's going to increase oxidation. Um, it promotes cavitation, uh, especially in pumps. Um, you know, it's going to promote rust and acidity, so that's correlated with uh, oxidation. It's it's going to age your oil uh, prematurely and build up acids and and become uh, potentially corrosive. Um, and then there's other things like viscosity effects, overall higher viscosity. So again, that's a, a function of oxidation. Um, aeration encourages foaming and air entrainment, uh, film strength loss. So you know, just, just like anything else um, or any other type of fluid or component, you know, water is not good. Um, and that's, you know, pretty obvious, but just wanted to give you a little bit of information as to what water actually does in your hydraulic fluids. Okay. Ways to detect water on your reports. Um, so this is where uh, the first kind of differentiation between a mobile uh, report and a stationary hydraulic report uh, comes to light. Um, for standard analysis on mobile samples, we will do the crackle method and we have three levels of positive identification of water, reportable, unacceptable, severe. Um, this should say hydraulic oils, my, my apologies. For hydraulic oils, it starts around 250 parts per million, so about 0.025%. And anything above or anything flagged as severe is typically above a thousand ppm, which uh, you know, as as a general guideline, is when you kind of pass that threshold of saturation uh, for standard for standard oils. Okay, N doesn't mean no water; it just means it's below the detection limit. Uh, so you could have I don't know 50 parts per million or 100 parts per million of water. Um, which can you know should be considered negligible, especially in mobile applications. As I said, you're going to uh, drop your oil um, way more frequent than you would for uh, a standard hydraulic system in a fixed plant uh, scenario. Um, equipment of higher criticality or of longer oil life uh, typically will use the Carl Fisher method. So this gives you um, specific quantity in parts per million or percentage. We start detection at 10 parts per million. So you can see this test is uh, way more precise and has a way lower detection limit. And um, this is useful if you, know, you definitely want to know, even at a very low concentration, uh, what your water percentage is. You know, some hydraulic systems and fluids might be way more sensitive to water than others. Right, so in some cases you may even want lower than 150 parts per million, um, which you know this result here would probably just show up as an N on your uh, crackle result. So just some differentiation between um, what you would see on on a report depending on um, what package you use. Okay, uh, moving on to ICP spectrometry. So wear metals, um, we talked about contaminants already. Um, but in terms of wear metals, uh, you're going to just, again, like any other uh, component type, you're going to want to know the, or uh, have as much knowledge as, uh, as possible regarding the composition of your actual system. You know, so if we just give you a report with iron and copper, you know, that's great. But what does that actually mean? Um, so again, just some general guidelines here, you know, basic hydraulic system, iron and chrome typically going to come from your cylinder rods, walls, it could come from your pistons, um, et cetera. Iron and copper, you know, uh, likely going to come from your pumps, um, 
uh, various components within your your piston pump, uh, and then copper and lead, you know, it's kind of the softer stuff, uh, typically going to come from bushings uh, in your cylinders or your gear pumps, etc. Um, again, know as much uh, regarding the composition of your components as you possibly can, and you can visit fluidlife.com for some additional um, ICP spectrometry pot potential source uh, guidelines. Okay, and then just to finish off on I ICP spectrometry, additives. Um, you know, additives are going to have uh, different functions in your hydraulic oil. You know, some are going to be dispersants, antioxidants, anti anti wear. Um, from a fundamental perspective, it's not necessarily important that you know exactly uh, what each specific element does in terms of additive functionality. Um, but you should mainly use these to identify lube mixing. You know, this is a pretty extreme uh, example here, but you can see in this most recent report, the additives are completely off. Uh, so when they are this uh, drastically different, it's likely evidence that a completely different lube uh, is in use. Um, to a lesser extent, it could be lube mixing. Now, you could, um, or you may have heard uh, to use additives as uh, additive depletion um, uh, evidence. That is kind of difficult to do, you know, depending on the nature of the additive uh, and the elements. You know, some additives, even if their additive job, you know, they've been sacrificed, they're no longer relevant um, in terms of uh, additive functionality, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're uh, elemental concentration and mass inside the oil is going to disappear, right? So that's a little bit more advanced um, if you're, if you're going to want to start using additive concentrations for depletions. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're well versed um, in all additives and how they behave when they are used up. Um, so for, for right now, if you're new to oil analysis, I would just say use additives as a uh, as a main identification or identifier for potential lube mixing um, or the wrong lube in use altogether. Okay, um, oxidation. So oxidation is something that you're going to get uh, more so for uh, fixed plane equipment, so oils in use for a longer period of time. Um, oxidation is essentially a natural process, uh, overall degradation of the oil. Um, you can't stop it. You know, there's a lot of additives that try to slow uh, the process um, and even, you know, prevent things like contaminants and water and heat uh, from accelerating oxidation. But uh, essentially, oxidation occurs as soon as the oil is done being refined. Um, it's the rate of oxidation that really matters. Okay, and oxidation is heavily influenced by temperature. Uh, contamination and obviously how long the oil is in service right that's why we can't leave oils in service forever um, they get old and thick and smelly and acidic and, and stuff like that so we have to change them um, on a report you know you're gonna get uh, OX value which is essentially oxidation and you'll see in a couple slides uh, how oxidation works you know, if you have accelerated oxidation or if you have prolonged usage of an oil, typically oxidation is going to be high, followed by, you know, uh, potential harmful byproducts. So um, your total acid number will measure, you know, the, the concentration of these acidic byproducts. Uh, the longer you leave an, an oxid, um, a heavily oxidated oil in service, uh, the more susceptible you are to the formation of deposits, uh, sludges, varnish, and stuff like that. And then when you have uh, a buildup um, over an extended period of time or a significant buildup of those byproducts, uh, it's likely going to finish in an increase uh, in viscosity. Right. So this little color scheme, you know, you have a nice clear brown. Uh, or light brown hydraulic oil oxidation occurs and you know you can even visually see oxidation if, if you hold an oil sample 
when it's dark like this, you know, it's likely smelly too. Um, that's just visual evidence of uh, oxidation occurring, but obviously this will be reported as well. So we can see here what it does. We have a very high rate of oxidation. We have a 68 grade uh, oil in use, and now our viscosity has increased uh, significantly almost to 100 centistokes at 40. So it, uh, it becomes dangerous when you allow oxidation um, you know, it, it, to prolong uh, in the life of your oil. Okay, acid number, I mentioned it a little bit there. Um, again, this is more common uh, for fixed or stationary hydraulics, uh, but it can be used in mo mobile hydraulics um, if you want to start doing condition-based oil changes. So we'll talk about that in the examples, but it's not uncommon uh, for mobile uh, equipment and even stationary equipment for that matter to just keep filtering um, hydraulic oil until it's no longer chemically sound and acid number would be one of those indicators. So in general, um, acid number measures the concentration of, the, of, of uh, acidic byproducts. Um, and it could be due to additive depletion, contamination, or prolonged oxidation. One uh, important thing to remember about acid number is, is, it, is it measures the overall concentration, but it doesn't necessarily measure the strength of the, um, the acidic compounds. There is a different test for that, but just because you have a high tan value doesn't necessarily mean that... Uh, your potential to corrosion is increasing. Um, it does mean that the oil is degrading, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to see evidence of corrosion. Okay, it's 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 not less likely, but it doesn't necessarily confirm that. So just wanted to to make that clear. Um, there is a difference between concentrate concentration and strength um, when you're looking at acid number and considering uh, acidic byproducts. Um, viscosity is uh, is can change. Um, you know, this was mentioned in, in in different webinars as well. There's a bunch of different reasons why viscosity can go up or down. Um, you know, again, if it's increased viscosity, premature degradation, extended service, contamination, lube mixing. So it's kind of the end result of of oxidation, either accelerated or or prolonged oil usage. And if it's decreased viscosity, I mean, it, it could be contamination, uh, lube mixing, improper lube selection. Um, but basically, you're going to want to use other results to try and figure out what happened, right? So like I said, if, if you have increased viscosity, check your oxidation, check your acid number. Uh, did I leave my oil in service for too long or is it prematurely uh, degrading? And you know, if you an example of decreased viscosity, uh, check my uh, additives. You know, um, I have a 32. Looks like my viscosity is a 32. It should be a 68, and I can confirm that by looking at my additives and seeing that they're skewed. Just uh, a, a summary of what I've been talking about here. So the two main concerns you're going to have uh, for basic hydraulic um, oil analysis is contamination and then degradation. And this is the typical pathway of degradation, right? You're going to have oxidation either by additive depletion, increased temperature, um, or contamination. And that's typically going to be followed by, you know, your oil is going to get darker, it's going to start to smell, um, you're going to get the formation of acidic byproducts, you know, potentially harmful products. Um, they could create deposits. They could make the oil corrosive, et cetera. And then as this continues, you should have an increase in viscosity. So that's kind of the typical roadmap. As you'll see in some of the examples, it's not always the case. You know, you could have a higher tan value, total acid number value without having high oxidation, and stuff like that, but um, in a general general sense, this is the pathway that it follows in terms of uh, chemical degradation. Okay, now some advanced tests. Um, 
varnish is probably the most important, uh, especially if you have uh, a really, really large or a high volume hydraulic system uh, with small clearances and, and a lot of servo valves and, um, and stuff like that. <clears throat> Varnish can be uh, potentially uh, very problematic to large systems like that. Um, what this test does, and it's sometimes unclear when I'm talking to clients, is this is the potential uh, to create varnish. So an oil's potential to create um, actual varnish, so actual deposits. It doesn't measure the amount of varnish deposited. It measures how likely your oil is to uh, create varnish and have it deposited everywhere. So if you're looking at reports and you have, you know, 62, 55, so high varnish potential results, and then all of a sudden it drops, so it goes back down to 10 uh, or 5 or whatever the case is, that likely means that varnish has dropped out, it's deposited, so it's no longer in solution in your oil. Okay, and once that happens, um, it's pretty difficult to get varnish out uh, when it's deposited. It's also not easy to get varnish out of solution in your oil. Um, if you are running into varnish issues, contact your filtration supplier. They have some pretty cool technology now uh, to try and extract uh, some varnish out of um, of your oil before it drops and starts depositing on your components. Just to finish off, a couple other advanced tests you can do to, to add on to your routine uh, testing. So IPH, as I mentioned, um, you know, total acid number will give you the concentration, but doesn't necessarily give you any insight into the strength. IPH is a test that we run at the same time as total acid number, and it lets you know if the acids that are forming in your oil are weak or strong, uh, and that'll give you a little bit of insight into the potential for corrosion. Total magnetic iron, um, also known as PQ index, uh, this measures the concentration of ferrous particles without any size limitations. So this is kind of an ICP spectrometry add-on. Uh, this piece of, of data will help you better correlate what your ISO particle counts uh, actually represents in terms of solid particulate, right? If you have an increase in ISO codes, but your magnetic iron stays relatively stable, well, then you might be able to determine that the majority of the increase in particulate uh, is coming from external sources, so dirt and dust and stuff like that. And then finally, analytical ferrography, again, is just to uh, complement high isoparticle counts. We do a, a microscopic analysis of the particulate to try and differentiate between wear uh, and contamination, and then we try and identify specific alloys and stuff like that as well. Okay, so uh, before we move on to the examples, um, just going to review the data interpretation process. So again, um, you know, unfortunately, I'm not showing you full reports here, so there's not much in terms of component hours, oil service hours, uh, you know, make, manu uh, make model of the equipment or oil types and stuff like that. Um, so we're just kind of playing make-believe here. But again, just want to kind of ingrain this to, to everyone. Um, you want to uh, remember all of this and follow these procedures as much as possible. So... Example number one, um, it's, a, it's a bad one, but uh, this one's easy to, to understand. Um, so let's go through what we have. So we have sodium potassium, so evidence of uh, external ingression. Um, we have iron, you know, lead was flagged previously. Okay, so we have some wear. We have water. Uh, the previous sample showed an extremely high concentration of water, so about 3,600 parts per million. That has since improved, but, um, or sorry, uh, 36,000. That's since improved, but we have about uh, 2,500 parts per million. Um, particle counts are high, and we had a high tan previous. So if I had to interpret this and try to make sense of everything, you know, obviously our oil is dirty, 
uh, over the past two samples. We have a lot of water ingression. Um, it looks like, you know, water is ingressing, uh, but it depends. Again, this is where I would look at our oil hours, right? So we had a lot of water. Um, the tan is high, so oxidation and uh, and uh, overall degradation is high, likely due to the water and possible uh, other uh, contaminants that we've had. My guess is that there was an oil change, so the oil is kind of chemically refreshed, but we immediately started having water problems again uh, and external uh, contamination problems again. Now, if this is actual water getting into the system and it's not just humidity, uh, water is rarely, rarely clean. You know, it's not someone uh, pouring a nice, fresh, filtered bottle of water into your oil. It's going to be, you know, if, if it's coming from the environment, you know, it's going to have uh, not, uh, general salts in it and stuff like that. And it likely has some uh, particulate in it, in it as well. So sodium, potassium, water, and these high particle counts here um, could all be correlated as just external ingression. If we look at what is happening, yeah, we are getting uh, some wear, right? Um, this is where you kind of have to decide, is this rust or is this actual wear generated from a uh, solid particulate? But in general, my response to this would be, okay, I have to change the oil immediately. We have to get that water out of there. Um, we have to uh, try and get rid of as much of the... Uh, the contamination and wear metal as well. But what you need to do also is try and figure out why this is happening. You know, do I, am I in a human, in, or a human environment or it's moist and I don't really have a, a desiccant breather or is someone literally pointing a pressure washer at my reservoir and, and it's getting in that way, right? There's a lot of water getting in, a lot of contamination. So you want to drop the oil um, so it's fresh and healthy again, but you also want to make sure you try and find out the source of this external uh, contamination as well. Okay, example number two. Example number one, you know, we it was basically a Christmas tree in terms of flags. So that's uh, going to be pretty rare if, if you compare it to, you know, the, the rest of your routine oil analysis reports. Um, here's another example of a stationary hydraulic report. Uh, so for this one, we have flag viscosity. Um, our particle count's really good. You know, we don't have any water. Oxidation is, is pretty healthy as well. So uh, we don't have any evidence here that the oil is, you know, oxidizing, it's degrading. Uh, we don't really have evidence of external contamination. What we do have evidence of, however, is a change in our additives. Okay, so if you remember what I said, one of the reasons for viscosity change just could be top up of the wrong oil or wrong oil type and use altogether. Well, here we have some, uh, some confirming evidence here. Our additive uh, formulation has changed. So good news, you know, this oil is, is not oxidizing prematurely, it's not full of water, uh, it's not full of contaminants, but someone did put the wrong oil type in use, um, which is why this flag occurred. So you'd have to decide, do I need to drop this right away? Or if it was a really, really big mistake and say you have 10,000 liters of this wrong oil type, you're probably going to want to consult with your OEM and see, you know, the thresholds of uh, acceptable uh, viscosity in, in terms of healthy operation for that particular application. Example number three, uh, so again, stationary hydraulic. All right, what do we have? Well, we have uh, flag ISO codes, so in particular, the 14 micron count. All right, um, what else? Viscosity seems to be good, no water, oxidation is below the detection limit. So chemically, our, our uh, oil is healthy. Um, and if we look at our wear metals, we don't really have any wear metals here. So this is an important example. 
Um, you know, I didn't include the uh, uh, sil silicon, um, uh, sodium, and potassium, but we can assume those are around zero, if not one uh, parts per million as well. So this example just goes to show that you can uh, have particle counts without any subsequent evidence in your elemental concentrations. Okay, it is personally, I think it's more rare to have um, all wear created above the ICP threshold as it would be to have all external contaminants above um, the ICP threshold. Right, so basically what we're saying is we have a higher count in above 14 microns, okay? That to me is evidence of increased external contamination. Now, it could also mean the sample was taken incorrectly, so the contaminants are in the bottle or the bottle was dropped on the ground or whatever the case is, but I think this increase in particle counts because we have no supporting evidence in wear metal concentrations, we can, you know, assume not 100%, but we can make a pretty good educated guess that this represents, you know, dirt and dust and, and stuff like that. So, what do we do? Um, it depends what your capabilities are. Uh, we can change the oil just to clean it up. We can decide that this is an acceptable amount of contamination. You know, so far there's no real wear generated, so we can ride it out uh, until the next change interval. Or we can also decide, you know, the oil is still healthy. I have a nice filter cart at my uh, 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 available to me. You know, it's like it's a two tiered, it's a 10 and a three micron or something like that. So it's going to get rid of, of a, lar uh, a lot of these larger particles. So I'm going to clean my oil out. You know, there's no wear. The oil is chemically healthy. So I'm going to keep using this oil. So three potential uh, responses um, to, to the same results here, depending on your maintenance uh, practices and what you guys are, are capable of, of actually doing. One last um, stationary hydraulic uh example and this is another extreme example but i just kind of wanted to show you all what to look out for so here we have uh increased viscosity and as we look for other evidence of why that might be happening i didn't include the additives so we can just assume it's not lube mixing but what we do have here is very high oxidation um and a pre pretty significant uh, concentration of acidic byproducts. So uh, yeah, oxidation this high, you know, if we follow that progression, I talked about high oxidation, um, increased acidic byproduct concentration, and we're finishing off by increased viscosity. Okay, this is an extreme example. Um, if you get to this point, you know, chances are you've doubled your oil drain interval or you've completely forgot about it um, or you know the oil is 100 celsius hotter than it's designed to be um, and it essentially cooked itself um, but yeah uh, this is the pattern you want to look out for when you have increased viscosity due to um, oxidation and, and degradation of the oil um, how is this going to affect uh, your wear metals. So I did say, you know, high acid does not always indicate uh, potential corrosion. So we have, yes, we have some here, right? We do have a little bit of copper. Typically when your, your oil is going to be acidic, it's going to attack the softer metals first. So copper, lead, and stuff like that. Um, but it's not extremely uh, high, not to a uh, really dangerous point here. Um, so yeah, your oil is oxidized, but uh, you know, hopefully those anti-corrosion additives and stuff like that are, are still working, or the acidic byproducts uh, created are not necessarily that corrosive at this point. Okay, um, example number five. So I have two uh, mobile hydraulic examples. Um, <clears throat> again, kind of the same idea. What do we have? Well, we have uh, ISO codes, um, so particle counts that are flagged. Viscosity looks okay. Uh, no water, so that's good. 
um, no real wear. And we have a little bit of silicon, which basically is going to tell us, you know, we have uh, these results here. We have a little bit of a mishmash in terms of these particle counts uh, increasing. You know, maybe it's it's uh, mostly contamination, but we do have a little bit of resulting wear. Now, this um, this type of situation is super common uh, for mobile hydraulics. You know, especially if you're working in a, in a dusty environment, um, this is where oil hours are really going to be important, right? If if you've reached this point at the end of your um, oil life. Um, and this doesn't keep occurring, you know, this could be an isolated event. You know, you can ask the operator, you know, were you doing something different or uh, was there a lot more dirt and dust flying around this time um, uh, or, or something like that? You know, you're going to want to trend it a lot more because this is not uncommon, especially in mobile hydraulics. If you start seeing this, you know, two, three times in a row, then, you know, maybe, you um, there is a there is a reason why uh, external ingression has increased, but um, you know events like this, one-offs, I'd say are, are more. Uh, assuming the samples were taken correctly, these are a little bit more common in mobile hydraulic applications. Okay, and then just to finish off, another super common scenario you're going to see in mobile hydraulics especially in, in underground mining operations or any human environment or anything like that is you're going to see uh, water flag as pr so reportable so again we're we're kind of in that range of 250 parts per million to about 500 parts per million so if, if we look at the other results you know, viscosity is okay. It's sheared down a little bit, but still acceptable. The oil is relatively clean, and we don't have too much in terms of contaminants uh, or wear metals. So I would guess this is just uh, humidity getting into the tank uh, through the breather. And again, you know, if, if you have really sensitive hydraulic oil, um, this could potentially be a problem. But for the majority of general uh, hydraulic oils and mobile applications, you know, they can handle this. Again, especially since you're going to drop the oil, um, you know, in maybe 500, 1,000, 2,000, whatever your intervals are. Um, so this is not necessarily a problem, but it is evidence of, you know, some humidity getting into your, your tank. So, again, just some of these examples is just, you know, not always panic. Uh, panicking or or deciding that a response is necessary uh, when you do have flags right if we go back to our um, data interpretation guideline here you know we can ignore the results and just chalk it off as uh, you know nature of that specific application or nature of that component so um, that's it uh, for me uh, just a, a quick thing about fluid life. How can we help? Well, obviously, uh, we're uh, a lab, um, you know, so if you're interested in any of those advanced tests I talk about, I can provide a bit more detail on, uh, on how they might help you on your ad hoc sampling or even upgrading your routine sampling. Um, if you're interested in more training, so more in-depth data interpretation or, you know, we can help you get some certifications. Um, or MyLab, which is our uh, which is our primary platform for oil analysis results and equipment and planning and scheduling and all that stuff. Um, training is available for that, and we are also a reliability services provider. So you know, benchmarking, audits, flagging optimization, SOP improvements, uh, lube program improvements, um, stuff like that. Uh, you can definitely. Uh, contact us and, and we can tell you what we can do for you there. So um, now, I guess, before we sign off, uh, if there are any questions, um, let me see in the chat. If anyone has any questions, um, you know, feel free to just type one into the chat and I will uh, read it and answer it. Or it looks like Benjamin has a question. Okay, so Benjamin has a couple questions here. 
his first question is, what would be the maximum limit for oxidation in hydraulic oil? Um, I would say you start getting serious, well, not serious, it should be something that you start paying attention to when you start to reach 15. Um, 20, 25 uh, are, is when you should start getting um, close to the condemning limits. For mobile applications, uh, it's going to be around that point too. Um, again, it's it's uh, it's more important to also cross-reference with your uh, hours. So if you've taken a sample 50 hours into um, you know after an oil change or something like that, and you already notice that you're at five or six, you know you're not necessarily at the at the point of condemnation there but it shouldn't be that high after that low of hours. So um, in a general sense, yeah, I would use say 15, 20 as, a, as an overall guideline. Um, but again, try and cross-reference that as much as you can with your oil hours. And what is max allowable MPC value? So we start flagging uh, MPC, I think it's around 20. I'm not sure what the specific limit is, but around 20 is when you're going to start getting the reportable, um, uh, the reportable, res uh, sorry, results, and or the reportable flags, so the yellow flags, and MPC values can fluctuate uh, pretty significantly, so don't be surprised if, you know, you have 22, and then you, you drop back down to 17, and then you might have 29. You're going to want to trend uh, the overall evolution. So when you start getting into the 20s and it's reportables, you're not necessarily really prone to varnish coming out of solution and depositing, but you are getting there. So that would be a, an indicator to say, you know, maybe I need to drop, uh, sweeten the oil um, before I, I get too high, uh, or I need to look at varnish removal uh, options through through filtration, you know, Statil. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I know they have uh, they have some uh, filter media that can pull it out that will uh, take it out of solution and, and hold on to it. And then I think they also use um, static electricity and, and stuff like that to uh, pull it out uh, of solution and then just grab it through normal filtration too. I believe that's it for Benjamin's questions. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to include it in the chat or just to write a quick question. Okay. Well, um, I believe that's it. So we'll end it here. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. I hope, uh, I hope you learned something. And um, like I said, feel free to contact us at any time if, if you have uh, any additional questions or want to learn more uh, about what we can do. Um, or if you even just want to, uh, you know, send in your first hydraulic sample or anything like that. All right. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all again for our next series of webinar presentations and training webinars.